All right. Okay. So what we talked about so far, and this is going to be just a little bit of review tonight, is we've talked about the different methods that people use for studying the Bible. And I'm going to review some of those if you if you don't remember, but it's the one, and I would say the one that is most misused is the allegorical method. Does anybody remember what that one means? What is the allegorical method? Raise your hand really high if you if you remember that. Nobody? Okay. The allegorical, does anybody know what an allegory is? Yeah, it's like um, if the name of the river is such and such, well, that means this because of that, and it's it's like a parable. It's an allegory, which means, okay, uh, I'll, I'll give an example of an allegory. Uh, turn with to me to Galatians chapter 4, verse number 21. Put that on the board if you would, so I can, I don't have to look it up every time. Galatians 4 and 21. Here, I'll just use this as an example, too. Okay, there, here's one. Uh, tell me that you desire to be under the law. Do you not hear the law? Verse 22. I hope this is right. Oh, yeah. For as it is written, Abraham had two sons, one of a bondmaid and one from a free woman, so Hagar and Sarah, right? And he who was born of the bondwoman was born after the flesh and... and uh, he of the free woman was born of the promise, keep going, which things are an allegory. For these two, for these two boys were actually two covenants, one from Mount Sinai and one from bondage, which is Hagar. And he goes on to talk about that. So he tells us right there that the two boys represent something else. They were real. They really lived and existed. But they represented two covenants, one of the flesh and one of the, of, the, of the promise, right? So one was from the spirit and one was from the uh, flesh. Are you with me? So that would be an allegory. So you can preach that all day long and not have any trouble. Now, if you go to the book of Luke, chapter 10, and you talk about the, the good Samaritan, and you say, well, the Samaritan represents lost humanity. No, sorry. The guy that got robbed and left for dead represents uh, lost humanity. The good Samaritan represents Jesus who took care of the guy and brought him to the, to the house or to the, um, the hotel, right, the inn. And that guy, that inn represents the New Testament church, which is responsible to help heal and uh, take care of the loss that Jesus finds until Jesus returns. And, and then we say, oh, that's, that is what that parable means. And those, who those, those are those who represent, those individuals represent these uh, offices. All right? That would be taking the parable out of context and trying to make that parable an allegory in which it wasn't. Okay, so here's what we do a lot of times is we take an allegorical approach to every single Scripture, and we try to find an allegory hidden within every single story, and what we end up with is basically we end up with a poor hermeneutics. Another, another uh, form is the mystical method or the over-spiritualization method. Then there's the devotional method where we just take uh, the Scripture, and I'm going to apply this to my life. If, if Jabez can pray that prayer, then I'm going to pray that same prayer and get the same results. So every single Scripture, I'm going to apply it to me. If I want to find out what car I'm going to buy, I'm going to start looking in the Bible and point to whatever the first color it's mentioned, and uh, that's the car. That's God speaking to me, and that's, okay, then there's the rationalistic method where we don't think that there's any actual miracles going on that, that you can explain how you can feed 5,000 with th five loaves and two fishes. And then there is the grammatical historical method. That's the one that we want to use. I've used, I said grammatical historical method, and I made a point to use it over and over to the point where I men mentioned, I was mentioning it a lot of 
Well, you probably weren't here. Do you remember that time when I kept saying grammatical historical method? And I said it over and over until the point where I said, you're probably sick of me hearing it, but I'm saying that on purpose because every time I say this from now on, you're going to know that that's the right one. The grammatical or the literal method, okay? All right, so last week we saw, we watched, sorry, we, our class was on context. Now, everything we've been talking about since we started is really about context. But last week we really focused on it, and we watched that little video on the book of uh, Obadiah, I think it was, that let us understand who wrote the book, who it was written to, the setting in which it was written. And I'll bet you've learned more about the book of Obadiah last week in four minutes than you've ever known in your entire life. Yes. So in the Old Testament, all of those, that, that um, link that we shared on Facebook and I think on Band is a link to all of those videos. I would encourage you to watch one of those videos before you begin reading one of the, any of those books in the Old Testament. It really helps it come alive because it puts the book into context, all right? And then we watched another video last week on the hermeneutical spiral, circle, or spiral. Either, either word is the same. The hermeneutical circle is when you look at a scripture or something that you're trying to uh, study out. I think in the example the guy used Shakespeare, you anything can be any any book that you're trying to interpret, a poem or any piece of literature that you're trying to interpret is called hermeneutics. We're just using that to identify how we want how we are going to interpret scripture because the, all of those principles would apply. So how do we find out um, what the author, original author, really wanted to convey, right? So we have to take a grammatical, historical approach, and we'll, we'll use all of the things that we've talked about already, and that is finding out the setting, finding out who wrote it, finding out who it was written to, what, the, what, the, what was the situation going on in history that would cause this, the scenario to evolve, right? So all of these things have to come into play so that you can begin to um, understand the Scripture. Now, last week, you remember, if you'll put that up there, brother, some of those uh, headlines, so just to jog our memory here. There we go. Some headlines you may come across can be alarming, aren't they? And they're supposed to be. That is the, the reason why um, editor, uh, article writers or news writers or whatever, they write the headline to get your attention because they want you to read the rest of the article. So most of the time, they're going to be a little bit um, out of the box, like crazy with it, right? It's the hook. If they can hook you with the headline, then they can get you to read the article. But you'll know this because you've been around long enough to know that the headline oftentimes is misleading, right? And it's like that on purpose. They want to spark your interest. It's like that. You scroll through Facebook, right? And you see the little headline and you click on it and then you're inundated with a bunch of ads. And you never even find out what it is you clicked on about, right? Well, why? why it's called, what is that called? Bait, isn't it? Clickbait. They want you to click it so that you can, they can sell you whatever they're trying to sell you. And if they can make that ad just interesting enough to click on it. All right, so this is, go to the next slide, the headless corpse accused in a court. Uh, students cook and serve grandparents. Obviously, you understand that these actually don't mean what they say. Until you read the rest of the article, you're kind of lost, Right? The problem with Bible scriptures and how we use how we usually read scripture is we don't read the entire article. We only, we usually just read the headlines. John three sixteen for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever should perish, whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's a headline, right? And if you don't read the rest of the scriptures, if you don't read the rest of the article, or in that case, the rest of the chapter then you are really not going to have a full picture of what Jesus was talking about when he said that to Nicodemus, right? All right. So, 
the hermeneutical circle is when you first read the Scripture or a headline or a verse, that's what I'm going to call every verse, first of all, should be considered a headline. If it gets your attention enough to memorize it or remember it, it ought to get your attention enough to go ahead and read the rest of the article, right? So you need to read the rest of the chapter. Read the whole book. Find out what, what all of those, you know, underlying themes are, and, and then this is you grammatically, historically, literally interpreting the Scripture. Because what we want to find out is we want to find out what the original author wanted to convey when they wrote it. This is important. And I'm going to say that one more time because this is, i got to ground this in. We've got to literally, or we have to interpret what the original author wanted to convey when he wrote it. Okay. So as you begin reading the headline, John 3.16, for instance, you're going to see that we have to believe. Then you're going to say, well, I'm going to read the rest of the article. And then you're going to say, oh, okay, uh, I've got to be born again of the water and the Spirit in order to enter into the kingdom of God. And I also have to bring my evil deeds into the light. So I have to first, con- I have to first believe that Jesus existed, and then I have to um, uh, bring my evil deeds into the light. I have to let my sins be- become reproved of God. And uh, because He is the light, and then I've got to be born again of the water and the Spirit. Are you with me? All right. So, once you do that, John 3.16 doesn't really mean the same thing that it meant to you originally, as now that you've gotten more context, right? So, that's the circle. You begin with a muddled understanding, kind of halfway understanding, Then as you begin to unfold and dive in and dig in, you make that circle back again to a literal. And then the best thing to do is to do that again. Say, well, now that I have a better understanding of the whole book or the whole chapter, I'm going to read it again, and I'm going to see if I can find more truth or if I can determine that maybe my first perceived uh, notion or belief could be adjusted one more time. And so that's us going through it over and over. And as you begin to understand the chapter, John chapter 3, then you want to start reading the whole book of John, and now you're going to look at John chapter 3, possibly, in a new light, because it's going to be surrounded and it's going to be supported by even more, uh, what would I say, grammatical, historical facts. And that's going to help us with this. All right, so that, in a nutshell, gets us back to where we are. And our homework was, I want you to go back and I want you to revisit uh, Joel, the book of Joel. And the reason why I said this is because the book of Joel is very popular because it's the, Joel is the Pentecost prophet, they say, because he was quoted at Pentecost, right? Now, if you start reading, and I'm just going to start reading the book, because if we look at this in an allegorical sense, we are going to misinterpret a lot of what the original author wanted to portray. So, go to chapter 1, verse number 1, and time wouldn't allow, but really be good if we just watched that video to let you see who wrote it, where was Joel, why he was writing it, what was the condition of Israel when he wrote it. But let's just do this. He says, the word of the Lord that came to Joel from the son of uh, Pethuel, hear this, ye old men, and give ear all the inhabitants of the land. Hath this been your, has, has anything happened like this in your days or the days of your father? Tell your children of it and let your children tell their children of it and their children tell another generation. And what, do, what are we supposed to tell our generations? Here he tells us. That which the palmer worm hath left, the locust hath eaten, and that which the locust hath left, the canker worm hath eaten, and that which the canker worm has left, the caterpillar hath eaten, awaken, ye drunkards, and weep. And howl, all ye drunkards of wine, because the new wine is cut off from your mouth. I'm going to stop right there. Well, we all know that wine is symbolic of the Spirit. We all know that. 
that the Holy Ghost is the new wine because the book of Joel tells us this. And so Joel is obviously telling us a story about the future of the outpouring of the Holy Ghost, that there is going to be a time when the drinkers of the new wine are going to be cut off and God is going to stop pouring out His new wine and there's going to be a period of time of devastation. And he calls this in this allegorical interpretation that this is the time between Pentecost when the falling away of the church happened and then I even have this written in my Bible in the margin on the side. I don't remember who I got it from, some Bible study. I want to say it was from the Search for Truth 2 Bible study chart from years ago. But I wrote on here that this time between verse 1 and verse 5 is the persecuted church between 96 and 300 A.D. And then he goes on. He says, now these people are going to be, um, verse 7, he hath laid my vine waste and he uh, barked at my fig tree and hath made it clean, bare, and cast it away. In other words, the canker worm and the locusts have eaten all of these things away. Lament like a virgin girded with sackcloth, the husband of your youth. The meat offering and the drink offering is cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests and ministers shall mourn because they don't have the Holy Ghost anymore. This is the period of time of the imperial church, 313 A.D. to 500 A.D., and then it goes on from there. And then you flip over here to uh, Joel chapter 2, verse number 22, Be ye not afraid, ye beasts of the field, for the pastors of the wilderness do spring, for the for the tree beareth her fruit, and the fig tree, the vine, that do yield her strength. Now, this is, according to whatever that interpretation I had all those years ago, is the time of the Great Reformation when Martin Luther comes out of the woodwork and says, no, we're going to turn back to Scripture, and we're going to come back to God, and then, and it shall come to pass. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Let me, I forgot the most important part. I apologize. Verse number 25, and I will restore to you. The years that the locust had eaten and the canker worm and the palmer worm and all of that, he says, okay, there's going to be a time when I'm going to pour out my Holy Ghost, and then I'm going to remove the Holy Ghost because people are going to turn away from truth, and then there's going to be a time when people are going to start coming back to me, and they're going to be searching for that new wine that's been cut off. Even the priests, the Scripture tells us, we just read it, even the priests are going to be dry and not have the Holy Ghost. Of course, that's the Catholic Church. They don't have the Holy Ghost, and the the popes didn't, and none of the priests did. This preach is really cool, doesn't it? And, And I go on, and this really gets you riled up if you're at a camp meeting somewhere. And I will restore to you the years that all of those had eaten, and ye shall eat in the plenty and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dwelt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be ashamed, and you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am your God, and none else, and there is none like me, and you shall never be ashamed. We always we know that He's going to take away our shame at Calvary, so He's obviously talking about a post-Calvary situation, and it shall come to pass afterwards. Wait, I, have I missed? Oh, wait, no, I did miss it. Sorry, i got to back up to verse 23. Okay, after Martin Luther comes out of the woodwork and says, no, we've got to come back to God, God then promises the latter-day outpouring. You ready? Verse 23, Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for He hath given you the former rain moderately, and He will cause it to come down and rain the former and the latter in the first month. It will rain together. So what's he talking about? He's talking about the initial outpouring of the Holy Ghost, and then the last days are going to come, and he's going to pour out the former and the latter rain. They're going to rain together, and we are going to see a Holy Ghost outpouring in the last days like we've never seen before. Praise God, and all the apostolics start running the aisles, and everybody gives that preacher a big pat on the back. But there is a serious, gross misinterpretation happening right here. Because then we have to reconcile Joel 2 and 28. Joel 2 and 27 says, And you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and none else, and my people shall never be ashamed. And then verse 28, between those two verses, a millennial 
A thousand years nearly passes. And how do we know that there is a time period that separates verse 27 from verse 28? How do we know that? Because the Scripture tells us. Not my allegorical interpretation, not my wishful thinking, not my Im- imaginary mind, do I'm going to try to imagine this allegory happening. The Scripture interprets itself, and it says, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will then pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. Now, hold on just a second. I thought chapter 1 was about the outpouring of the Holy Ghost at Pentecost. I thought that chapter 1 tells us about the new wine. I thought chapter 1 was the one that told us that how the falling away from the, and then there was going to be a latter and the former rain and all of that. And the former rain was Pentecost and the latter rain was the Azusa Street Revival. And the, but then we have this other thing that's, and we've got to reconcile this. It says after the former and the latter rain come down and restore the ground. He says, after that, then I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. So the question is, when did this begin? Did the outpouring of the Holy Ghost begin? No, did verse 28 begin at Pentecost? Or did verse 28 begin at Azusa Street? Well, Peter, why don't you let us know? Flip over to Acts chapter 2, verse number, whatever that one is. Acts chapter 2, verse number, I don't know, what, 5 or 6? 13 or 14? When they said, when they were all, and there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind filled all the house where they were sitting, peered unto them, clothed in tongues, and fire sat upon each. They were all speaking in tongues, magnifying God. His spirit gave them the utterance. And when this was noised abroad, all the men in the Jerusalem heard this, said, These men are drunk. And Peter, standing up with the eleven, said, These are not, are not drunk as you suppose. It is only the nine o'clock in the morning. But this is that which was prophesied by Joel 2 28. That this first outpouring of the Holy Ghost is Joel 2.28, not Joel 2.25 or 2.24 or anything in chapter 1. This event, the day of Pentecost outpouring revival, was this is what was going to happen afterwards. So then we've got to ask our question, okay, when did the last days begin? Because Paul, because God, or I'm sorry, uh, Joel says, and it shall come to pass afterwards, in the last days, saith God. So we always think last days means end of days, like now, end of time, right before Jesus comes. That's the last days. Because there are other scriptures in the Bible that you can go to when Jesus is talking about the last days, and he does talk about events that will happen in the, just before the coming of the Son of Man. And so that might confuse us into thinking that every time in Scripture that it calls the last days, last days, it's referring to the very end. But we have to let Scripture interpret itself. Peter tells us exactly when the last days Joel is talking about is going to begin. The last days of the outpouring of the Holy Ghost begin at Pentecost 2,000 years ago. So here's the question then, well, what about the latter rain? Well, remember, that didn't happen after Joel 2.28. It happened prior to Joel 2.28. It happened before the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. So what was Joel rambling on about in chapter 1 and the first half of chapter 2? Well, I hate to break everybody's allegorical bubble, But he was talking about a literal thing that was going to take place. Now, how do you know that? Because Scripture interprets itself. Follow me to Deuteronomy chapter, let's see where we're at. 
28 and verse 38. Moses is instructing the people that uh, these, God's going to be your God and, and he's going to save you and he's going to protect you and all this stuff's going to be great. But if you ever turn away from God, he's going to do this bad thing to you. And here's what he said. You ready? Thou shalt carry much seed out into the field and shall gather but little in. Why are you going to gather little crops? Because the locusts shall consume it. Keep going. Thou shalt plant vineyards and dress them, but thou shalt neither drink of the wine nor gather the grapes, for the worms hath eaten them. Sound a little bit like Joel. Next verse. Huh? And thou shalt have olive trees throughout the coast, but thou shalt not anoint thyself with oil. There's that oil. For thine oil shall be cast of his fruit, verse 41, and, and thou shalt beget sons and daughters, but thou shalt not enjoy them, for they shall go into captivity. One more time. And thy trees and thy fruit of thy land shall the locusts consume. So what was happening in Joel's day was a prophecy being fulfilled that Deuteronomy said was going to happen. When you turn away from me, I'm going to send this bad thing upon you. So this is what was literally going on. And you read any commentary that's worth its weight. I'm not talking about go to sermon.com and find a good sermon. I'm talking about you go to a commentary. They're going to tell you that the first chapter of Joel is a literal thing. And in fact, Sister um, Barnett brought me this documentation of the 1800s where the locust came in to Colorado and devastated the entire state and all the way up into Canada, I think it was. And she said that there were so many locusts. They were eating the, the locusts were eating the, um, uh, the cotton, or what I call it, off of the animals. What was that? The wool off of the sheep. They were eating the, the, uh, the shovels or the picks, the handles. They were eating the paint off of wagons. They devastated the entire area. She said for six days you couldn't see the sun. It was the worst uh, locust devastation in history. Well, besides Joel. So what is Joel describing? He's describing a literal thing that would happen. And he said, he told Joel, you tell those preachers and those priests that they need to pray. And if they will turn back to me, then I will cause the rain to come and I will heal their land. Now, this goes back again to uh, Chronicles 13 when, when he says, he told Solomon the same thing, didn't he? He said, Solomon, today I have filled the temple and this is great and I've heard your prayer, but there's coming a day when the people are going to turn from me and I will uh, cause the the, their land to languish, and I will cause drought to come. But if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and turn and seek my face, then will I hear from heaven, and I will heal their land. So this is what is being foretold here. Is This is a literal thing that's taking place. Now, can you preach this and say, you know what? By the way, the canker worm and the palmer worm and the, the other worm and all the worms that are mentioned there, it's actually one bug as it morphs into different manifestations of the, you know, how bugs can change. They go from a worm to another and another and another. You, yeah, that's like, right? A caterpillar turns into a butterfly. Okay, this is the, the progression. Now, could you preach a principle here? And you could say, you know what? If you turn from God, that's like sin entering your life. And let me tell you the devastation of sin. And you could use that whole locust thing that happened in Colorado and you could preach that and say, don't sin because it's going to take you further than you ever wanted to go, keep you ever, farther than you ever wanted to stay, and cost you more than you ever planned on spending. You could preach that sermon, but you cannot say that this was the original intent of the author's interpretation, and that's what you wanted to get from the book of Joel chapter 1. You can't say that. You can preach a principle, and you can, even if you wanted to, you could reach out a little bit. And you could say the outpouring of the Holy Ghost is like rain falling because Joel said it. You could kind of, you're getting pretty far away from the book. But maybe your finger's right on the edge. And you could still preach that, but you can't say Joel said it. And, there, and this is where we get in trouble. 
Because if I'm up here preaching it, and I'm going to tell you that I preach this because I heard it preached this way the whole time I was in the church. I heard preachers at camp meetings preach the latter-day outpouring. And there's going to be more people receiving the Holy Ghost in the last days, according to Joel, than has ever happened. It's going to make, literally quoted from my notes, I've said this, and I've repeated it from other pastors, the latter-day outpouring is going to make the day of Pentecost look like a morning dew. I've, I've quoted, I've said that. And I came off the platform one time, and there was a man on the pew, and he said, Pastor Whitaker, I need you to explain something to me because I'm confused. There's going to be a former reign, and that's Pentecost. And I said, yes. And there's going to be a latter reign, which began somewhere at Zusa Street. I said, yes, that's right. According to the scripture, yes. Standing very firm on my belief of that allegorical interpretation. And he said, so what you're telling me is God pulled back the outpouring of the Holy Ghost during this time. I'm like, well, no, maybe I don't think God did that. So the, the Holy Ghost has been available the same since Pentecost to now. Well, yes, I said, that makes sense. Anyway, as he began to question my theology, I sort of realized, and I don't know that I know what I think I know about that. And so that made me go back and do another circle. And I did another circle. And I realized that the former, and I started looking up former rain, latter rain, and I started thinking about, wait a minute, the former rain, maybe that was the Old Testament preparing us for the New Testament because the former rain always prepares the ground for the new rain, and then the latter rain always brings the crops. And so maybe the former rain was the forerunner. Well, then maybe I thought, well, maybe the former rain was John the Baptist. So this is me circling again. I keep circling back. And then I got to Joel 2.28 again. I started reading it again like the 18th time, and it says, and it shall come to pass afterwards, and I realized right there that that right there, that word, I never really put it into play. And that word afterwards tells me that the former, the latter, all that stuff that Joel was talking about from chapter 1 all the way up to chapter 227 was a physical thing that was going to happen, and then there was going to be the Pentecost. So that was the hermeneutical circle. And, and so every time I come back to teach this at, uh, at this class, um, I know I'm going to get pushback from the people who have been taught this their whole lives, the allegorical interpretation of Joel chapter 1 verse and chapter 2. Uh, I go back again, and I read it over again, and I try to do that hermeneutical circle over again, and I try to, try to figure out, well, maybe I'm not seeing maybe you know, whatever. But every time I go back, in fact, today was the day I went back and found those other Old Testament scriptures that prophesied about this was going to happen in the physical sense. Okay, so can you preach uh, principles, allegorical principles? You can, but you have to let, if scripture interprets itself and it goes against what you've believed or thought, then you can't stick to your guns. Does that make sense? You have to let Scripture interpret itself. All right, let's go to another one real quick. And I, 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 I taught this before, and I said, uh, I challenge you to, um, if you can find it, that the latter rain is this day's and it's not whatever. And I heard somebody yell out from the crowd, challenge accepted. But they never came back. I was hoping they would do their study and come back. And help me. So if you are listening at home and uh, challenge accepted, if you say, you know what, Pastor, you're wrong, the latter day outpouring is now, and the former rain was Pentecost, according to Scripture, I would like for you to call me and give me a one two information. All right. So let's look at this one. Why did God change Saul's name to Paul? Why did God change? Abraham's name, Abram to Abraham. Why did he do that? Anybody? That's an easy one. Because he wanted to. There you go. That's a good enough answer. Uh, why did God change Jacob's name to Israel? 
Same answer, because he wanted to. There's reasons behind it, but really we don't really care about the reasons at this point. Why did God change Peter's name, Simon's name, to Peter? He wanted to. And there was a reason for it. And there's a significance behind the name. So why did God change, change Saul's name to Paul? Has anybody ever heard that preached or taught that God changed his name to Paul? He didn't change his name. Right. It's the same name. Paul does mean Saul. Uh, Saul is his Jewish name, and Paul is his Gentile, his Greek name. Translated, Saul is Greek and Paul, and since he was going to be a preacher to the Gentiles, he went ahead and just kept the Paul instead so he could uh, be have a connection. So there's that. Anybody know why Judah went to war first? They said, who shall we send into battle first, God? And God said, send Judah. Does anybody know why? Because Judah means praise. And so somebody somewhere preached that, that that's why God sent Judah first is because Judah's name means praise. And boy, did they get aroused in so much that it's stuck. I don't know how many hundreds of years we've been preaching and teaching that. They have songs about it. Send up Judah. This is how I get my victory. This is how battles are won. How's that song go? Yeah, yeah, that song. Send up Judah, send up Judah first. Where in Scripture does it say that God sent Judah up because his name meant praise? Nowhere in Scripture. In fact, the Scripture tells us why he said send Judah first. And it's found in Judges 1 and 2. And the Lord said, Judah shall go up. Behold, I have delivered the land into his hand. That's it. So why did God do it? Because he wanted to. He says, I have already given the land to Judah. It's already his for an inheritance. He already owns it. And one could argue Judah was the one who was given the promise of lineage, remember? The scepter shall not depart from him. The, 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 your, your brother shall bow down to you, Judah. His, his lineage was going to produce Jesus, right? I mean, that could be argued right there that they sent Judah in because they knew he wasn't going to be annihilated. There was promises to his name. But it wasn't because Judah's name bent praise. Now, could you preach a principle? Could you preach some sort of an allegory here saying his name means praise? He went to battle first, so we ought to praise God first. If you're in a battle, then you ought to send Judah first and praise. Yes, you could do that, I think, all day long and get away with it. But you can't say that the writer of the book of Judges meant for us to believe that the reason, the only reason, was because his name meant praise and that means we should clap our hands and sing when we go into a battle. I don't think that we can say that and be hermeneutically correct. Does that make sense? So this is us going through some of these, uh, the allegorical interpretation method and, and using these as examples to show that I want you to question, oh, how about this one? Why did God say, that it's easier for a rich man to enter heaven than it is for a camel, a camel to go through the eye of the needle. Yes. Anybody else besides Lily? Because the door, right, that you see the two doors in my office, and everybody says, what are those doors for? And I say, well, I have to go through the story every time. I say, well, these are the eye of the needle. And they say, the preachers will preach, and I'm sure you've heard it preached this way, that in, the, uh, in, in a fortified city, there's big gates that they open up, and, you know, you can let um, chariots and wagons and all kinds of stuff through. But when they're under siege, they close the doors, and they open the little doors that are in the middle, the small doors, and that will only let one person in at a time, very narrow, very small, and insomuch that a camel is so big, they can carry up to, I don't know, 500 times their weight, something crazy, 
they will have to kneel down and unpack their goods and crawl through this floor. Very slow process. And so they, so this, the, the city, is if they're under siege, they cannot be uh, breached by the small doors. And they call those small doors the eye of the needle. Therefore, what Jesus meant, they say, is that a man must first unpack his goods, kneel down, humble himself to God, and then crawl his way in humility into the kingdom. That's what they say. Unfortunately, that is an allegorical interpretation, and it's not correct. The fact remains that that eye of the needle interpretation of the doors within the doors wasn't even established or a thing until the 13th century. In other words, they didn't build doors like that in Jesus' day. They didn't do that until the 13th century. And one might argue that they called the doors within the doors the eye of the needle because Jesus said this, not the other way around. So what did Jesus really mean? Well, what he really meant is what they call, a, he, what he was c- communicating to us, it was a hyperbole, and a hyperbole is a method of speech, like a figure of speech, that literally would be interpreted impossible. It would be impossible for you to fit a dog through the eye of a needle. It would be impossible for you, and in those days, a common phrase was an elephant could not fit through the eye of a needle. So who knows? Maybe there was a camel standing there. And Jesus says it'd be easier for a camel to fit through the eye of the needle. It was almost comical. He was making a hyperbole, which is to state something grossly impossible to get a point across. That's a hyperbole. Now, he doesn't mean literally that a rich person cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. He doesn't mean that. Uh, God's not against people having money. But he is against the... the um, the thought process and the, the character that comes with a lot of times with people who have greed. Okay, so that was what he was talking about. Does this make sense? So if every passage and every scripture has to have an allegorical implication, then we're not using the grammatical, historical method, and we're not understanding this hermeneutical circle correctly. So if you get anything from this class, question everything you've ever been taught, question everything I've ever taught you, Question everything you've ever read until you read the rest of the article. Any questions on context? Praise the Lord. We'll see you next week. And if we don't, then uh, I'll see you in heaven.